Hello, hi everyone. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, my name is Trisha Turbold, and I'm the resident director for ACMS. Um, we are coming live from Ulaanbaatar. Uh, it's 9.30 in the morning here. Um, so just quickly, I'll tell you a little bit about ACMS. Uh, ACMS is a nonprofit educational organization. Uh, we work to strengthen and deepen academic and cultural connections between the United States and Mongolia. Uh, usually we have a speaker series event twice a month um, here in Mongolia to help share research that's being done on Mongolia with our audience. Um, however, due to social distancing uh, restrictions and many other uh, changes going on in the world that we're all facing in the midst of COVID-19, um, we've been unable to host our event since January. So we decided to try to move our speaker series online so that we could continue to engage with all of you and try to provide you with some interesting and relevant research on Mongolia. Um, so thank you again for tuning in. This is our first ever virtual speaker series, so um, it's a little bit of an experiment today, and we hope everything goes smoothly. Um, so our speaker today, our presenter today, is Ms. Dolgion Aldar. Um, she's currently based in East Timor. Um, her presentation, which we will play for you shortly, has been pre-recorded, um, but she's going to connect with us live afterwards for a virtual Q&A session. Um, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, you can submit your questions in the live chat box. You can also submit questions on our website. If you're watching on our website, you can see a comment section below the video. Um, so please go ahead and post your questions and we'll read those live after we play the presentation for you. So now I'll tell you a little bit about our speaker, uh, Ms. Dolgion Aldar. Um, her presentation today is titled 30 Years After Mongolia's Democratic Revolution, A Vicious Cycle of Democracy. So Dolgion is a research professional focused on promoting evidence-based policy making and social cohesion in Mongolia. She's the former CEO and current board member of the Independent Research Institute of Mongolia. She recently completed a fellowship at the National Endowment for, or of Democracy in the United States to develop a report on strengthening democratic ideals and values as they relate to equality in Mongolia. Dogion holds a master's degree in political science from the University of Manchester and in sociology from the National University of Mongolia. Now we will premiere her presentation and we encourage you to post your questions, whether you're watching on YouTube or on our website. Um, and please stay tuned after the presentation for our live Q&A session. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, thanks for being here and I would like to start my presentation by thanking ACMS for inviting me to be part of their speaker series. Uh, today I would like to talk about democracy in Mongolia and why I chose this title is are we in a vicious cycle of declining democracy. So in doing that I'll look at first of all um, what kind of general image we have about democracy and what is the quality and depth of democracy as well as what might be causing potential slide and potentially even vicious cycle. And finally, if I have enough time, I would like to talk more about how can we restore this kind of current situation. So this, many of you are already familiar with Mongolian history and background. Um, so I would skip that and start directly um, from mo most recent times after 30 years of democratic revolution, where we are now. So let's look at this uh, um, map. This is a map done by Freedom House on the Freedom in the World. 
the green uh, countries are those that are free. Uh, blue or purple, they are not free. And yellow ones are those who are partially free. And as you can see from the map, you'll, Mongolia stands out within the region, especially compared to our neighbors that we come across as free. So in many cases, Mongolians like to take pride, of course, that our democratic revolution didn't uh, in, involve any violence. It was based on mutual tolerance and it was done peacefully. That's one thing that we are part of our history. Another thing is uh, looking at this map and seeing how free we are compared to our neighbors and in the region. But I would like to argue that maybe this just looking at this map itself is not enough and there's more going on to do with democracy in our country so to do that we need to look at how what is the quality of our democracy in the current situation what do i mean by quality it's is democracy being exercised in a good process is the process well is there enough rule of law is there enough accountability etc but also we need to look at um, the content of democracy. So what do people actually value? Do they, uh, are they more inclined towards equality? Uh, are, are they more inclined towards freedom or both, etc.? So that's another indicator. And also we need to look at the government responsiveness to the needs of the people. So taking all these things into account, we are talking about quality of democracy. So, of course, I can't go through all of them one by one, but I chose only two uh, key indicators to have a look how well, uh, what is the quality of our democracy. So first and obvious one is, of course, can we control corruption? And as this map shows, um, it's a worldwide governance index 2019, shows that Mongolia actually is not an island anymore. In terms of corruption, if anything, it's very similar to the countries like Kazakhstan and China and India, slightly better than Russia, but still we're not an island. So that's something that we cannot be proud of. Another um, indicator I'd like to share is government effectiveness. So here, alarmingly, we rank worse than our neighbors. As you can see, what do I mean by government effectiveness is not me, sorry, the world governance indicators. Uh, what they mean by government effectiveness, it's mostly the capacity of the government to implement the decisions um, and actually deliver on their decisions. So it, of course, doesn't necessarily look at if the decisions were just or inclusive and quality, uh, good quality, etc. It mostly looks at the capacity to deliver. So in that sense, we rank worse than our neighbors. And maybe that's why many people like to compare democracies with non-democracies and argue that maybe non-democracies fare better. But I would argue it's not the case. Uh, there are many other quality indicators that non-democracies would rank much lower than <coughs> um, democracies. So long story short, we can argue that we are faring very poorly in terms of quality of democracy. Um, another substantive way of looking at democracy is to actually see if how people understand what people mean when they say democracy, how people understand it, and is democratic principles and values are actually embedded in culture. So to do that, Asian Barometer Survey asked um, from countries in Asia whether people agree with some democratic principles, and to also, because many questions can be leading and there's an agreement bias, it also tests those questions by asking more authoritarian inclined questions and ask respondents to disagree with them. So that's a very good way of <clears throat> measuring the actual um, situation. So here I am giving you the responses. That's uh, Asian Barometer Survey from 2018. So the first one is about 
whether uh, government leaders are like the head of the family. So that's why we should all follow their decisions. And as you can see, the responses of those who disagreed is very low. Most people agreed. And sim it's similar to Malaysia. So most people responded, yes, we agree. The government, government leaders are like our uh, head of our family, so we should follow them. So that's one of the signs of potential authoritarian uh, incline. With the next slide, the government should decide whether certain ideas should be allowed to be discussed in the society. Most people in Mongolia who participate in the survey tended to agree with this idea, which also shows that people are more willing to accept more authoritarian incline, uh, similar to the countries in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Malaysia. The next one, if we have political leaders who are morally upright, we should we can let them decide everything and this is a very uh, obviously telling statement and in that one again most people in mongolia agree, tended to agree the mean score is two as you can see um as you know there are famous quotes for example that says power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so this graph generally shows that people are willing to maybe accept that kind of um, incline. The next one, if the government is constantly checked, uh, meaning monitored and supervised by, by the legislature, it cannot possibly accomplish great things. It, it would be very hard for the government to do things. And for that one, uh, the response was slightly better than the previous ones. 2.75, but still people are more inclined to agree with that statement. Another statement, if people have too many different ways of thinking, society will be chaotic. Again, that's one of the statements that most people tended to agree. So it shows that Mongolians maybe uh, tend to think that too much diversity and pluralism is not healthy and instead it would be better to have more homogeneous or similar types of ideas within the society. So this also shows that maybe we might uh, not have developed the full, uh, embedded fully certain principles of liberal democracy. Next one, when that's the most dangerous one I find also in that statement. When the country is facing a difficult situation, it is okay for the government to disregard the law to deal with the situation. So this is very relevant to where we are now uh, with COVID. Many countries in the world now uh, have um, started state of emergency where they can disregard certain laws, etc. And to that statement, uh, the country that responded the most agreeable uh, answers were Vietnam, followed by Mongolia. And even few countries like Philippines, Thailand, um, and the others have tendency to disagree with the statement. The strongest ones were uh, Korea and Myanmar. So that's very interesting. So all these kind of survey responses from the Asian Barometer Survey show that there is a lack of awareness, knowledge, and practice of certain democratic values among the public, and this is very dangerous because it is likely to be exploited by the political elite in Mongolia, regardless of their political membership or regardless of uh, the given situation. So there are many examples of how undemocratic behavior or practices are becoming normalized in recent years. Um, for example, it, it has a long tradition, of course, starting from around the 2000s with the amendment in the constitution. Uh, and since then, it's continuing. But in recent years, it's becoming more and more uh, severe. Uh, just to take the latest examples, they're the combination of both forceful and soft approach to undermine democratic norms. For example, in 2018, in December, 
the government decided to seize um, silver uh, mining site. And there was a whole special operation. It was televised and uh, live streamed on social media. And it gave some kind, it divided the population almost into two. Um, some thinking it's great, our state has a strong ability to act and it's effective. Um, so it gave some kind of positive ideas in that way. But the criticism was that why is it the fact that government and why at the time the former head of cabinet secretariat is there doing this special operation of seizing a mining site or whatever the consequence was. So this gave a very strange image uh, on to the people that government can just conduct such special operations and just see, stop uh, temporary or permanently uh, private uh, companies or activities. So the question is why there has been no con um, previous courts and how has the previous democratic institutions have been used remained unclear. A uh, softer approach is, um, I would like to take one example, the president's 2020 New Year message gave uh, very positive news to the society that the government um, or the state has decided to cancel all the um, pension-backed bank loans of uh, pensioners. I'm not criticizing that decision per se, but how this decision was made, was it based on evidence? Did it use consultative approach? Did it comply with the development policy uh, and planning and different laws, regulations? That would remains very um, questionable. So although the intentions might be good or not bad, but the processes, how these decisions are being made are not always following uh, democratic norms. And the most dangerous thing about this is that the more such kind of uh, behavior is repeated, practice is repeated, uh, it becomes the norm to break uh, all the democratic practices. So uh, as we can see from other countries' examples, there the whole literature on evolutionary dictatorship, evolutionary authoritarianism, and how democracies die gradually rather than suddenly. Also, another set of exam examples and alarming um, activities I'd like to say in the last few years is the shrinking of civic space in Mongolia. So there have been attempts and different draft laws to limit the capacity of uh, civil society organizations in Mongolia. There, uh, for example, a lot of uh, information about how uh, NGOs act, can act as money laundering agencies, as foreign agents, as pocket NGOs, etc. Although these ones can be true in some ways, but it's not the whole of civil society. So just using these uh, excuses to control the entire civic space is not something uh, that we desire as a democratic society. So luckily there is a pushback against that and there's more um, events happening in that area. Also, there have been many more attacks against journalists. And with the passing of the recent renew, um, renewal of criminal law, with the use of the law and violations, for example, there's a lot of um, defamation issues. And even individuals, not only journalists, are being trialed or fined a certain amount of money. And I should also highlight that there's a generally lack of participation and deliberation in passing important policies and laws in the country. Um, laws on public hearing, rights information, glass account law, all the previous achieved achievements have not been fully sustained. There's no sign of continuing using these tools to strengthen the democracy we have so far. So all these undemocratic practices that are not being called and that are not being taken into account is uh, extremely dangerous, especially in today's time where uh, the COVID-19 pandemic situation can give leeway um, 
possibility for the government to control civic space also. So we just need to be very careful about these developments. So all these changes and potential slide in democracy doesn't happen just as a result of the elite, political elite's actions. It can happen when there is an underlying uh, social or economic or underlying cultural problems. So it would be naive to imagine that this happens just as a result of few people's actions. Of course, it's true, but there's more going on to um, cause these problems. So then I would like to move on to the next section, has democracy delivered? So the key question we ask today ourselves is people, of course, like democratic ideals, would like to have them, but if it's not delivering to them or changing their lives, why should we commit to democracy? So that's a very common uh, rhetoric that are being developed and we hear today. So looking back at the 30 years, last 30 years and what we have achieved um, and what is the current level of socioeconomic inequality uh, would be a separate topic, but I can just take uh, two examples, very obvious examples. So this graph shows the GDP increase uh, in Mongolia since 1990s. So we have um, been able to develop our economy, diversify it, and our GDP has grown at least threefold in the last 30 years. But on the other hand, you can see that the poverty line, the poverty rate um, hasn't decreased. In 1994, it was 36%. In 2018, it's 28%. You can see a slight decline that happened in 2014 sudden, actually not slight, sudden decline, but again, sudden uh, growth of poverty rate within only six years between 2012 and 2016. This shows that although poverty looks like it's declining, there is a lot of people who live very close to the poverty line in a vulnerable situation. If any uh, global recession or economic crisis, any um, impact like that happens, many people are very uh, vulnerable to slide, slide back to poverty. So that shows that the growth has not been equally distributed within our society. And also it's uh, maybe worth pointing out that the social spending, the social protection um, budget in Mongolia is not that low compared to other uh, Asian and also especially post-communist um, Eastern European countries, we fare relatively high. So the question is why, despite the economic growth and high social spending, the poverty rate is still high. So another case I would like to show in terms of the inequality, socioeconomic inequality is um, Human Development Index. You can see that all of, in the last 30 years, we gained uh, a lot of achievements in the human development as a country, as an average. But when we break this down into regions, you can see that UB Lambatter is progressing constantly in the human development index, whereas all the other parts of Mongolia is lagging behind, especially since 2009-10, after the third uh, financial crisis, the regional disparities have increased significantly. So you can see that shocking uh, disparity. So this shows that we have all sorts of different types of socioeconomic inequality in Mongolia. So this slide is the most important slide I would like you to take away from today because it explains the current situation in Mongolia, why democracy is declining and why inequality is increasing within the global context. So let me start with the socioeconomic inequality and how it leads to democratic support declines. Of course, when people have uh, their life situation not improving as it was promised or expected 30 years ago, the trust in institutions start declining, 
the trust in the entire democratic system starts declining, especially um, with the current leaders as well. So that leads to general kind of ambiguous um, dissatisfaction with this thing called democracy. So what this uh, declined support for democracy leads to is the breeding ground for undemocratic changes to happen uh, gradually in the country, often exploited by the elite uh, who captured the current governance system. So how it works is, of course, uh, when public is dissatisfied with the current um, ineffective government or lack of uh, capacity of government, they would like to see strong leaders, quick fixes, quick solutions, um, and very easy ways of dealing with problems. And unfortunately, it's easily exploited by uh, people. So this slow, gradual, undemocratic changes, or in other words, um, the key guardrails of democratic institutions being eroded, leads to poor governance, which means lack of transparency. The people cannot fully participate in policy making, in decision making, uh, in making sure that the resources are spent without any corruption, etc., which leads into ineffective governance and poor services. In turn, this exacerbates the socioeconomic inequality, doesn't help reducing it. So we are in this kind of cycle where um, both the declining support for democracy and increasing perception of socioeconomic inequality reinforce each other. Unfortunately, it's a very um, alarming time. Right now we are facing in Mongolia because we have unfavorable external conditions as well. So as you can see from this graph, uh, first of all, we have abundant uh, wealth of natural resources. It's a good thing if we can exploit it well, but unfortunately we know globally there's a history of how uh, global wealth, um, sorry, the um, natural resources can be exploited by few people, uh, particularly if you elite especially in the absence of democratic, strong democratic institutions. So that's one bad news we have. And the second bad news is that international environment uh, really matters whether democracy can succeed or not. Uh, when globally there's a rhetor re strong rhetoric for democracy, we've seen, for example, 30 years ago, there was a surge in democratic movements, but now we see the opposite. Uh, especially with the um, two are coming from our two neighbors, Russia and China, there's a very strong global rhetoric for more authoritarian uh, favor in terms of governance. We see, for example, people supporting strong leadership, presidential systems. Already many countries started changing their constitution towards uh, more presidential systems, for example. So given this context, we are now in a perfect storm. Another point to add to this uh, current uh, perfect storm is the global situation we're facing right now uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic. It's most likely that um, global recession will happen. And on top of that, in many countries, uh, slightly authoritarian regimes or even electoral democracies who are trying to um, prevent from democratic slides already showed signs of decline in terms of democracy. So to summarize my point, I think we are at the tipping point in terms of our democracy and also uh, further social development. Um, I took this picture from social media um, because it illustrates how people feel uh, today. So the voters in democracy, they are losing out in the last 30 years. They end up living in poverty, in air pollution, and deprived from basic social services. Whereas the leaders in democracy, they are enjoying their lives behind big bars and fences, um, in their pool, playing golf, 
etc. And this whole system of injustice is labeled as democracy. So this clearly shows people's preference and uh, wish for quick fixes for reducing socioeconomic inequality, and they want to see their lives improving. So in that sense, unfortunately, like I mentioned in the previous um, sections, unless democracy is purposefully used in a good quality and in a good substantial way, the cycle of inequality will persist. It won't disappear by itself. Unfortunately, all democracies do not automatically reduce inequality. So we have to purposefully use. And if inequality persists, it will erode democracy. So that's what I mean in being we are at the tipping point and we need to take quick actions. And I think um, I'm generally positive and I don't think that's the end of the world and we will um, be trapped in this vicious cycle forever. Because compared to 30 years ago, when everything was starting uh, new, we have today a lot of activists, organizations, and individuals with uh, different capacities and institutional capacities uh, who are pro-social rights, who are pro-democratic. So I'm not talking about particular um, political groups or particular urban groups, etc. I mean, this is involve, um, involving people all over the country, including uh, com local community groups, are the groups who are fighting for their own rights uh, and who have proven successful in the past as well. So I think we have a strong um, and diverse civil society and we need to collaborate. Um, and few if you ask me what are the key focus areas we can uh, work on in the next maybe 10 years to get a, a way, break away from this vicious cycle, um, in my opinion, there are three key areas that need attention. First, the quality of democracy. So in terms of process, we need to pay attention on uh, demanding accountability. Uh, the NGOs, all the actors within the society needs to improve their uh, mechanisms and ability to demand accountability from the government, not only through elections, but be in between elections. Uh, so that's one area. Second area is to increase youth participation in politics. Um, unfortunately, this time I didn't have time to share my thoughts on that that much, but um, that we can talk in another occasion, hopefully. Uh, death of democracy. So that's more substantial. Uh, democracy, of course, means protecting civil and political rights. But in my opinion, and also based on my previous slides, just the protecting the political and civil rights is not enough. We need to ensure and include social rights is part of the death of democracy, is a key part of um democracy. To do that, of course, we can um, work broadly with the population, for example, through civic education. And finally, socioeconomic equality, that should be a separate focus area for everyone in this country, uh, especially to bring awareness of social rights among the, let's say, middle or those people who can actually make change or who are in a much privileged position to be able to affect changes, but their awareness about social rights needs to be increased. And secondly, we need to support short and midterm socioeconomic policies that will support reducing socioeconomic inequality. So any political parties or agenda uh, needs to take into consideration this angle in the last few years. And I believe the key agent or driver of change in all those would be a strong civil society in Mongolia. So that's my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, well, all right. Well, thank you so much, Dogeon. Um, a really interesting and important 
um, presentation and work that you're doing. So we're actually really pleased to see that we have um, several listeners tuning in and we have lots of comments and questions. So we're going to go ahead and I'll read some of those now. Um, so let's see here. We have our first question. Uh, okay. So Brian from Santa Fe um, is curious about the role of news media in shining a light on corruption. He asks, how would you characterize the local media's role in achieving this? Um, Dolgion, sorry to interrupt. It, it sounds like the your sound is not coming through, so uh, excuse us while we try to get the sound going through. They can't hear her. Should be good now. Okay, so um, Dolgion, let's do a test and see if uh, folks are able to hear you now. Yeah, no sound. Uh, there's, my microphone seems to be working fine, yeah, but no sound. Not sure how. Uh, there's, my microphone seems to be working fine, yeah, but no sound. Okay. All right. Seems like we've figured it out. So thank you all for bearing with us. So. Um, Dolgiam, do you want to just kind of address the question, start over? Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to, ha since we have a lot of questions, Brian, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip to the next um, comment. So we have a, a comment from Sarul, and he uh, or she has said that one of the gradual changes I see is persistent vacuuming of the population out of true information spread and manipulating with fake and irrelevant news, no clear channels for raising voices. So this is kind of related to the previous question, but do you want to comment on that, Dolgion? Okay. I think we, it's, it's, it looks well, like the so. sound is back for you, Dolgion. So let's, let's go ahead and try to continue with the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see uh, Greg Pringles question about the charts on authoritarianism, despite China being an authoritarian society, uh, opposition to authoritarianism is high, Mongolia is opposite. That's exactly what I was thinking uh, when I was looking at the uh, data. Uh, so I need to clarify with um, Asian Barometer Survey people. Can you hear us fine? Yes. Okay, yes, so I need to clarify that first and also look at the past uh, waves of the survey, but also uh, I'm not sure how the questions were worded in, in uh, the local language, for example, and that's certainly the next interesting uh, area to explore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't have the readily available answer right now why and I had such a strong um, position or disagreement with those. Also, it should be noted that from other social capital uh, related surveys conducted in China uh, on trust issues, for example, there's a very strong uh, trust. China always ranks highest uh, in terms of trust. But when you look at which kind of trust, it's often within family relationships or uh, small uh, kind of area of people. And there's a less trust in institutions and also in um, strangers. So the general trust is not that high. So I think the fact that China uh, might have um, strong disagreements with those um, questions could be also related to that trust issue. But it's only an assumption we need to explore more. Okay. 
Great. So um, Christian from Colorado. Um, so I, I apologize if if we're repeating any of any of the points or questions, but feel free to move past them if so, Dolgown. But um, further, uh, let's see. His first: Do you think that the party system also contributes to people's disillusionment with democracy? It seems that the DP and the MPP don't offer contrasting visions. Uh, and then he follows up to say, further to that point, can democracy address inequality under capitalism? Just some light questions for you. Uh, yeah, very easy. Yeah, let me in one minute. <laughs> no, just kidding. So I think um, the party, the uh, system we have uh, with a strong parliamentary system is not the problem. A uh, main issue, in my opinion, is the law on uh, political parties, the law on general elections, and um, accompanying regulations. So once now that we already have been able to address some of these issues through the recent constitutional amendment, <coughs> now the work needs to be done on revising these key uh, regulating uh, legislation. So with that, I think it can be uh, improved. But if we look at other presidential systems, for example, where other countries uh, went in, at the outset of the democratic revolutions everywhere, it, they tended to become much more uh, authoritarian. So in that sense, I think our system helped us, but it needs to be... Um, we're only juvenile in terms of democracy, only 30 years. So we need to constantly improve. And we shouldn't be too, at the same time, critical about ourselves. If we look at back history and the improvements we made, it's been tremendous compared to other new democracies. So we just need to keep improving the system and uh, kind of break this vicious cycle of the elite capture and all this situation, starting with the um, direct calling of accountability on those uh, people. And when I talk about vicious cycle, I don't see this as something that's just out in the air, beyond our capacity, no one's responsible for, no. I think there are clear, clearly institutions responsible for that, there are people who run those institutions, so it's very clear what we can do. Mm. So that's the one good side. And in terms of addressing socioeconomic inequality under capitalism, uh, capitalism itself has a lot of varieties, so we need to discuss what kind of, which variety of capitalism we are uh, embracing. So in that sense, if we can uh, balance the positive sides of capitalism with social orientation, protecting social rights as key of our democracy, I'm sure we can uh, achieve those, and there are also international experiences countries like Costa Rica that have been extremely successful in addressing socioeconomic inequality under democratic system with competitive uh, elections and political parties. So we need to also start looking elsewhere for some work in our past history as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, Professor Atwood from the Philadelphia area is has a few questions and comments. I'll read those now. Uh, with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic, Mongolia's response has been relatively effective in preventing community transmission. Has this improved the legitimacy of democratic governance, or is it attributed to and seen as, um, I think, legitimating authoritarian measures? And what was the fate of the of President Batulga's suggestion to delay the upcoming parliamentary election? So, um, sort of two part question there. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the COVID nineteen response, uh, general population has supported most of the uh, government decisions because I think there was a general agreement that the. Uh, Right now, our priority is protecting public health. So in that sense, the public support it. And the interesting change we saw is that the key um, every day, for example, 
press conferences were delivered by professionals and uh, rather than politicians. So I think this played a role in seeing that actually our uh, government is run as effectively based on evidence normally how we should be run, we can be actually effective. It's not something fundamentally flawed in our system. Uh, so I think this created hope in the sense that we, if we had less politicization, less involvement in uh, civil service, people in their work, it can work. So this exposed uh, that positive sign. But on the other, other hand, there have been low, a lot of reported cases where uh, people were prevented from expressing their uh, uh, dissatisfaction. They were spread uh, under the name of um, people cannot be gathered, etc. But unfortunately, these news have not been as widespread uh, as the government messaging itself. So that's why I fear that the current situation can be easily big if uh, maybe a major unlawful decisions by the government is made and civil society wants to protest. In that case, maybe we have the risk of uh, not being able to prevent any unlawful actions. And uh, President Batolka's uh, um, proposal, has, I think it's not been finalized regarding the general election, but uh, local elections definitely uh, there's a schedule. Um, scheduled in October 2020. Uh, I saw on his website how he, uh, how the president office worded the polling question. And it was, like I mentioned in my uh, presentation, a very leading, equipment biased question. So this shows that the president's maybe um, desire to postpone the elections. Okay. But I searched for it just before the presentation, I couldn't find it again, so I don't know if okay. they deleted it or I couldn't find it. All right, um, so Karen has asked, will you give us a few of your best suggestions on ways to increase youth participation both in UB and in the rest of the more rural areas of Mongolia? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are many, many ways, but one of the starting points I would like to highlight is we need to change quite significantly how government engages with citizens, how, uh, what are the regular mechanisms with, uh, to engage citizens. Most of the existing mechanisms are very outdated, uh, they work only uh, for very dedicated and maybe nothing else to do to follow those uh, regulations. For example, if you want to express your complaint um, and receive um, responses, you need to wait for at least 30 days, or say maximum 30 days, but usually it takes up to 30 days. Uh, have very formal letters, uh, or sometimes have to go, you have to go this by yourself, and the information is not of you are interested in. So we need to start with changing all the mechanisms from the viewpoint of the citizens, not we are government, we are formal, and that's how our uh, relations work since uh, 30 years ago or hundreds of years ago. I think that's where uh, we should start and move have the potential to maybe redesign, uh, create a few prototypes of potential innovative mechanisms to choose from certain e, um, democracy guardrail institutions like the anti-corruption agency or national audit office or inspection agency. We can pilot there and then if it works, we can expand throughout the entire government. Okay. 
Um, so Mari is tuning in at 5 a.m. from Finland, so let's go ahead and take her question next. Um, although you explain how the current situation is not only the matter of the political elite, do you see that some sort of a new party could potentially shift the political s landscape somewhat? No. Um, I think definitely we need renewed leadership in our current system, and of course it's not uh, all that's necessary. I mentioned that in in this authoritarianism, if leaders of moral sound, they have good heart, can we trust them fully and call them fully? I would say still say no, we shouldn't. But it is important to have strong uh, alternative leadership especially the uh, democratic institutions that keep the check and balance at the same time possible in bed because of the democratic values things happen mostly. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, finish up with one last question. We're coming up on an hour now, so um, Bill has asked, do you think there are too many Zooms, um, too much bureaucracy, or are all the, or are all the Zooms, um, do they need to be closer to rural people? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult question, and also key, um, one of the key debate topic of the constitutional amendment, and what should the strategy unit should be. Uh, can you hear me? It's it's going yes. in and out a little so, bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, I have very mixed feelings about that. Uh, there's a very famous article a um, long time ago that it must, some countries like Canada or US, it's possible that people uh, congregate around a few large cities and we don't need people everywhere. But Mongolia is quite different. We have semi nomadic style, we have different um, um, culture and way of living. So I think it, for the time being, it, we should leave no one behind just because there are a few people. We should still uh, have all the necessary services, and some play an important role in delivering those services even in remote parts of the country. So I have mixed feelings about that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dolgion, for um, being our guinea pig with this first virtual speaker series on uh, working with us um, so well. And thank you to everyone for tuning in and for those who have stuck around, we really appreciate it. And we apologize for some of the technical difficulties that we had. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do more of these in the future. Um, and we thank you all for watching and see you soon.